Welcome to our online worship service from Grace Lutheran Church, Hastings, Michigan. We are glad that you hear the call of Jesus to be ones who share of your very life with everyone you come in contact with. Wanted to let you know that we're going to take a Turkeyville trip to see a show and a dinner. It's $46 per person. We have, I believe, only one spot left. I might have calculated or counted wrong, but we are so pleased with your response and quick response to fill those spots up. Wanted to also share with you that Books for Kids, that is a program that we are placing for Mrs. Gibbons. Her classroom will receive, we hope, $500 at the least to go toward the outreach of buying books for children. We're so pleased that we can support this class and support reading for young children. Wanted to share with you that prayer requests can now be written down on the back as you enter the sanctuary, and those prayer requests will be prayed during our worship service today. Wanted to also share with you that the Brothers of Grace September outing is September 13th. We hope that you can join us here at Grace Lutheran Church at 5 p.m. as we go out to his place. Wanted to also thank you for the wonderful support you have given to our campaign. As you can see through the bulletin, if you are reading it, we have an outstanding amount to raise of $3,442 to complete that first phase of getting monies toward our new HVAC in the Fellowship Hall. October 9th is our crop walk. We hope that you can place that on your calendar and be there. And finally, game night along with pizza is coming. That's September 17th. Please sign up by September 11th so that we have a true count. We appreciate your partnership and your wonderful gift of generosity as we continue to be partners sharing the love of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Enjoy worship at this time. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever welcomes me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and ask for the terms of peace. So, therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. My friends, I have shared with you the wonderful gift of being under the direction of my internship supervisor, John Walker. What a gift. And last week, as a way of celebrating his goodbye, he collected hats. And Laura and I gave a hat that we wanted to share with him about a frog. It was a golf cap because we had gone twice on a golf scramble and had a wonderful time sharing that and having fun, sharing the love of God. 
And we thought, well, that is a creative way. It's a golf hat for one, and two, it talks about God's creation. Because God's creation, John Walker, was very creative. And we were glad to give that possession away that we bought and we were able to share with him. It doesn't stop with our ability to have given that away that we have a memory of sharing that possession with him and giving it away to him. It has continued to be a memory, continues to be a way of celebrating someone we love so much. And I hope that when you give something away, you can celebrate the love of God that you're giving away freely. May each of us sell our possessions, give away our possessions all the time for giving it away allows us to celebrate God's rich joy in our life. Let us pray. Dear God, help us always celebrate you by giving away our possessions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. See you next week. Grace, mercy, peace be with you. In the name of our triune God. Amen. While writing this sermon, I reflected on how people are quitting their jobs quietly, or maybe not so quietly. As best as I can tell, quiet quitting is happening even in the church. Secretaries, church musicians, youth workers, and even pastors are ceasing to go above and beyond in one's job. Quiet quitters fulfill basic employment responsibilities and requirements, but they do not seek out extra responsibilities, and they do not look to their jobs for their passion or otherwise define themselves by their paid work. Quiet quitters may be biding their time until they can actually quit their jobs or they may simply be adjusting their relationship to their work to one they consider more suitable. The quiet quitting model provides an apt description of how most of us Christians fulfill our roles as disciples. Enough to get by, absolutely. Enough to look the part, by all means, but never going above and beyond. After all, in this week's Gospel reading, Jesus has thrown down the gauntlet regarding the requirements of discipleship. Disciples have to be all in. There can be no quiet quitters among the followers of Jesus. We, followers of Jesus, must be willing to reject our families and rid ourselves of our possessions to invoke the universal pop culture cliché from Yoda. Do or do not. There is no try. Still, my friends, discipleship is not a job. I may be a so-called professional Christian, but I am not called to be more or less of a disciple than any other Christian in this congregation of Grace Lutheran Church. I think that sometimes pastors and other professional church staff members are seen as the ones who should carry the discipleship load. But Jesus reminds us that discipleship is given to all who seek to follow God. Pastors and organists and secretaries are not paid to be Christians, we're paid to complete particular tasks for and with the community of faith that calls us. But the sacrifices of discipleship, the complete reorientation of our lives toward the way of Jesus, are normative for all Christians. We are all called by Jesus to make sacrifices and solidarity and common purpose of sharing the love of God. 
Many published versions of today's gospel reading will add the heading, the cost of discipleship. But that phrase is not in Luke's text. I will admit that I have an aversion to economic metaphors, the idea that anything and everything must be bartered, counted, and exchanged seems abhorrent to God's extravagant, practical, overflowing, abundant, generous grace, which beckons, come, buy wine and money without milk, without money and without price, as read in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. I expect the tendency toward the language of cost is drawn not only from the idea that one must sell all possessions, as declared by Jesus, but also from the example Jesus gives, the builder who fails to calculate the cost of the project and then is ridiculed when the project is unable to be finished. The assumption that gets us from Jesus' metaphor to the cost of discipleship is that the disciples are like the builders. And in the same way, we place the disciples as kings going to war, which means that the disciples are like the king who is sure to calculate whether he can win with fewer forces or must look for favorable terms of surrender. Maybe that's indeed is what Jesus in the Gospel of Luke intended with the examples, but I find myself wondering if we're plugging in the wrong characters into these variables. Is it possible that Jesus is sizing up his own resources, those who would be his disciples, and has concluded that he can't afford followers with divided loyalties? Are Jesus' mission and purpose dragged down by the way we cling to the comforts of this world? In that case, this passage would better be titled, The Cost of Disciples. Alternatively, my friends, Perhaps we could dispense with language of cost altogether. After all, Jesus' parables are not necessarily meant to be allegories where every element neatly aligns in a one-to-one -one ratio with the reality they are illuminating. The examples of the builder and the king call us to size up the whole of the situation when contemplating discipleship. Following Jesus becomes not a calculation, but a reorientation, a turning toward the cross and away from the world, walking a new path, as read in today's first reading of Deuteronomy. Luke just happens to be the gospel text appointed for this Labor Day weekend, which honors the American workers. While discipleship is not a job, the intersection of this passage with Labor Day reminds us that discipleship does matter for our jobs. Discipleship has sway on how we make money and how much of it we make and what we do with it once we make it. If we are turned toward Jesus in every aspect of life, then the cross is before us in our work and in our play. In other words, discipleship is our vocation, regardless of what our jobs are, including retirement. My friends, the path of discipleship can be an exceedingly lonely one. After all, this passage begins with the threat of estrangement from some of our closest relationships. And yet, the promise of discipleship is that we never really walk that path alone. We always walk with Jesus, and as we do, we encounter others who have turned in the same direction. As a disciple of Christ, as a follower of Jesus, you, my friends, are specially equipped by the Holy Spirit to share the love of God. Why? Because you carry the cross. You suffer with those 
in your life, you walk humbly with those who are in need. I thank God for you. Blessings to you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.